I think it's fitting this afternoon we're going to hear Dr. Kevin T. Schwartz, a great state scholar in Franciscan tradition. Uh, Kevin, as many of you know, is a very good friend of mine, and so it's a, it's a double treat for me to be able to introduce him and hear him talk. As a young man, St. Francis was a rich, charming, uh, he was handsome and educated. Kevin is educated. <laughs> 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 Francis had all these gifts, but in the end he desired wholeness more than any of those gifts. Or better, he realized that these gifts were only blessings if they brought if they brought into harmony with each other through love of God. And Francis wanted uh, the people he loved to have wholeness. And here at Villanova, it's important to reflect on the ways that our lives as scholars and students and teachers are also vocations of holiness. I can't think of a better person to talk about all this in relation to Bonaventure than Kevin Hughes. We're extraordinarily fortunate to have Kevin here at Villanova. He joined the faculty in 1997, currently enjoys a joint appointment in the Department of Humanities and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. He's also the chair of the Department of Humanities and the Classic Studies Classics Program. His teaching interests are focused on contemporary and historical theology. Kevin's teaching is guided by the conviction that studying the Christian tradition can disclose new possibilities for contemporary Christian life and practice. His research specialties are in ancient and medieval Christian theology, spirituality, and history. He's the author or editor of four scholarly books and he is published in some of the most prominent journals of theology in the nation and at deeper level. When you come to know Kevin as I do, you realize there's something animating all of those activities that I've talked about. When I think about what animates Kevin's work, I'm reminded of the story about St. Francis. In a moment of prayer in a ruined church, Francis heard a voice coming down from the crucifix. It said, my house is in ruins, rebuild it. Francis immediately, of course, started raising money and collecting stones to rebuild the physical church he was in. And gradually he realized that God meant something more, that Francis was being called to revive the church through new forms of life and witness. That story reminds me of Kevin and what animates his work. Each stone that he sets in his career is a response to a call to build and rebuild something greater than an article or a book or a class. Each of Kevin's articles or books or classes are full of the kind of affection <clears throat> that makes them important not just for themselves, but also for something more deeper, and something deeper and more elemental. Each are expressions of his service to God and his fellow pilgrims, and so each are precious stones in an edifice of which we are all lucky to be part. For myself, I feel very fortunate to be part of Kevin's life and work. It's one of my great joys to be his friend. And for all these reasons, I'm pleased to introduce his talk this afternoon, which is entitled Between Paris and Assisi, Bonaventure, Franciscan scholar and saint. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, gosh, what do I say? I feel like I should uh, look for the other guy at this point. Um, thank you, Tom. That was very, very kind. Um, it's a great delight to be uh, introduced by a friend. And I'm here to tell you, uh, at the risk of sounding ridiculous and corny, I'm here to tell you about somebody who, in a way, is a kind of friend, patron, sponsor, something. <laughs> 
for, for me. He's not just an interest. Uh, he's somebody who I've really taken as uh, a model for the kind of work that, uh, that I hope to do. And so I hope I can convey to you a little bit of why that might be the case uh, and what he has to offer to us. Um, so I hope everybody will be able to see the slides. We have some challenges. We're going to uh, videotape this and how do we get that on the video and make sure that people show up and all that. So I hope you can see this, but I have some slides to go along. And the reason I'm starting with some slides is because it, for me, part of, the, uh, part of the adventure, I guess, of uh, studying the Middle Ages, studying medieval theology in particular, is that it invites a kind of um, expansion of the imagination. Um, to see the world through different eyes. And uh, that's something that I think sometimes uh, art and architecture, music, if you came in early, I had some you know, atmospherics going. Um, I think that that can all help. And so um, I'm here to present sort of the whole package to you insofar as I can. Uh, if it looks like I'm glowing, this is the microphone, you know, that, so. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to have this blue light looking at me all the time, but here we go. So, Paris, 1235. Bright young boy, John of Fidanza, arrived in Paris, and he was 18 years old. He came from Bagno Reggio, a beautiful little town just north of Italy. Um, and you can see that the town is really um, perched on top of a mountain with kind of a, a craters all around. It, it's a, just an astonishingly beautiful place. Um, there's another shot. I love that shot. Good point. You want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a field trip. Um, he came from Bagno Reggio. I, I say center and circumference. Bonaventure is a deeply symbolic thinker. And one of the great scholars of Bonaventure, Zachary Hayes, said that when he went to visit Bagno Reggio, he realized why this image of center and circumference was sort of elemental for Bonaventure, that it may have done, had something to do with where he grew up. How could you not have a sensitivity to what's center and what's periphery if you lived there? <laughs> but at the age of 18, he comes to Paris, college freshman. Um, and he took up his studies in liberal arts under an impressive master, one of the best, Alexander of Hales, whom Bonaventure, till his dying day, always referred to as uh, our beloved Alexander, one of those mentor figures that we're sometimes we're lucky enough to have in our life. Uh, Alexander was that for Bonaventure uh, when he was just John. <laughs> his name is John of Fidanza. He, he studied under Alexander. He took his Master of Arts degree. And around about that time, Alexander himself underwent a kind of conversion experience. He was a priest. He was a secular priest, you know, a, a, a non-regular priest, a diocesan priest, we would say. Um, but he really felt drawn to the Franciscans, and so he joined the Franciscans, which caused a bit of a scandal because the faculty at Paris really didn't, uh, they didn't want these new, crazy, smelly, <laughs> poor uh, Franciscans around. But Alexander already had his, he already had tenure, basically, right? So they couldn't kick him out. He became a Franciscan, and, and John of Fidanza, uh, joined him and took a new name, Bonaventure. Good fortune. Good luck. Um, Bonaventura. Um, although he would go on to travel throughout Europe, visiting once he became Minister General of the Franciscan Order, he would travel, walk, literally walk, all across Europe. He always considered Paris home. He never really left Paris as a place of residence after 1235. Uh, although he had a, quite a reputation as an intellectual, he was kind of a slight fellow. Um, there's a later representation of him joining the order. He was kind of a slight fellow, a little bit sickly, wasn't quite up to uh, the, some of the rigors of some of those Franciscans. Now, that's asking a lot, I guess. Um, crazy Franciscans that they are sometimes. Um, he was a little frail. He also had kind of an earthy streak. Um, he was the first, it seems, and in his commentary on the Gospel of John, uh, he was the first to coin a phrase that became famous uh, under, uh, by uh, General George Stilwell. 
Stilwell said, and Bonaventure said it first, well, you know, they, when he's talking about pride, he said, well, the, the higher a monkey climbs, the more you can see of his behind, right? This is right in the middle of his commentary on John. So, um, so was, you know, so he had a sense of humor. He had, uh, you know, that earthy streak there. But he was, above all, an intellectual. He was a teacher. He was a thinker. What's important to note there is that Bonaventure became Bonaventure. Bonaventure became a Franciscan through his experience of studying theology in Paris, not in spite of it. Sometimes I think the image that we have of Franciscans is that they're, you know, off in the wilderness, and often they were. But Bonaventure, for Bonaventure, the two could always fit together. Now, this was not always obvious even to his confreres that Paris and Assisi could go together. Francis is may be well known to you and maybe not, and Tom said some uh, wonderful things about him in the, the introduction. Uh, you've probably seen his statue in a bird bath or in a garden if you haven't seen him anywhere else. Uh, Francis was, con was convinced that the whole world proclaimed God's glory. You may be familiar, he wrote this beautiful song, poem, the Canticle of the Creatures or the Canticle of Brother Son. And the, the the cadence of that song is all about God being praised by and through everything. The sun, the moon, the water, even death praises God, said Bonaventure. I uh, said Francis. And Bonaventure is going to pick up that insight. Uh, Francis had spent his adult life uh, wandering around, begging for his food, preaching the gospel. He wanted more than anything else to imitate Jesus as perfectly as possible. He would use terms like to walk in the Lord's footsteps as literally as he could. When people began to join him in his way of life, when, and he had to put together a rule, a way of life for these people, all he did was he opened up the scriptures, he read the Sermon on the Mount, and kind of took little excerpts of it. And then he took that to the Pope and said, this is the way of life I want to live. What do you think? Well, how do you say no to that? Right? This is the gospel. Is that okay? So he got approved. Um, Innocent, Pope Innocent there had had a dream before Francis arrived that a funny man in a brown cloak uh, was holding up the corner of the church. And uh, so that's what this slide is. Innocent, see, seeing Francis with this compelling passion and yet utter simplicity, thought this might be just the thing that could help save the church. And so he approved him. But Francis's vision of a form of life was most distinctive in its commitment to humility and to poverty. His community is called, still to this day, the Friars Minor, which is really the lesser brothers. It's not even little, it's not even small, right? Not least, but lesser. Which invites the, co the question, well, lesser than whom? And that's kind of the point, right? Lesser than whoever you're around. <laughs> Wherever you find yourself, you put yourself in a position to be lesser, to serve. So humility was central to Francis' vision. I would even argue that poverty, being poor, right, giving up all your worldly possessions, wandering around begging for your food, was really part of Francis' vision of humility. What would it take to be truly humble? Well, one of the things it would take was letting go of all that stuff, all those things that we have in our life that keep us feeling secure and stable and therefore self-assured. What if you gave that all up? This is Francis's vision. What would you have left? By the way, if you're interested in Francis, um, my, I, sort of, <laughs> I, got on, I got into this mess years ago. I think I was uh, 19, maybe. I read G.K. Chesterton's little biography of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. It's worth reading. I really recommend it. More recently, there's a great book by Valerie Martin that's kind of a novelization of the life of Francis um, that, that I like a lot, too. So check that out. All right. So poverty is one of these prime expressions uh, of this call to be lesser. People who own things tend to be treated as more important than people who don't. So ownership is a currency of power, and to beg is to be a loser. Francis essentially wanted himself and wanted his brothers to refuse to play that power game. He just didn't want to play. 
Now here's the trick. Academics, you may be surprised to know, have their own power game. <laughs> then and now, right? I just came back from the American Academy of Religion, uh, which is, you know, like 10,000 scholars of religion, theologians and other scholars, scholars of other religions, etc. And it's remarkable the, uh, what, the kind of jockeying for position. And, you know, nobody looks you in the eye. They look at your name tag first to see if you're somebody. <laughs> right? Look at your name tag, and then you look up. You look, right? Why? Well, because one of the things that we do as academics when we're, not, when we're on our <laughs> not on our best behavior is we tend to treat our own knowledge, our own uh, accomplishments as power, right? At least over each other, <laughs> right? So in practice, it's not necessarily different from Wall Street or whatever when we're not having a good day, right? If that's true today, it was true in Bonaventure's time. Francis had profound doubts about whether study was something Franciscans should do. Uh, in one of the legends of Francis, um, he, uh, his, his companion, Brother Leo, records this conversation. He says, one of the brothers asked Blessed Francis, tell me, Father, when you first began to have brothers, what was your, what was your intention? And what is it today? And what do you believe it will be until the day of your death? You see, there's desire to get a pretty definite answer here. And Francis is recorded to have said, uh, I tell you, brother, that it has been my first and last intention, and will, if the brothers would only heed me, will be that no brother should have anything except a tunic, as the rule allows, together with cord and underwear. Right? That's it. <laughs> they just should, they should have nothing to own. The, this person came back, this person asked the question and said, well, what about our books? And he repeated the same phrase. They should have a tunic, as the rule allows, with cord and underwear. Right? So, so Francis was profoundly sort of unsettled by, by study, what, what study would mean. Why? Well, for precisely that reason, for that power game. There's another great story. This is, this is my favorite. I love it. Um, <laughs> there was a brother who came to Francis, and, and he, just, he just wanted a Psalter, a psalm book, right? He could read, he was educated, and he just wanted to read so he could pray, right? So he, he came to Francis, and he said, I know the rule says we shouldn't have any books or anything, but, you know, could I have a Psalter? And Francis hemmed and hawed and put him off for a little bit. He came back again, said, please, I really, you know, I just like a Psalter, I just want to pray. And Francis hemmed and hawed again. And finally, Francis relented and gave it to him. But then he felt bad about it. He chased the guy down the road, who was happy, probably on the way to the bookstore, right? <laughs> he chased the guy down the road, and he said, let's go back. I need to take back what I said. And the guy said, what? Why would we do that? He said, I'm going to make sure I get this right. He said, brother, after you have a Psalter, you will desire and want a breviary, a bigger book. After you have a breviary, you will sit in a fancy chair like a great archbishop telling your brother, bring me my breviary. <laughs> and speaking in this way with great intensity of spirit, he took some ashes in his hand and he poured it on his head and he sat there, he's staring at the brother, he says, I, a breviary. Uh, it's Francis. I, a breviary, right? He's just trying to make this point that it's the identification of the I with the breviary that has a kind of a well, at least his worry is that there's a kind of attachment there so that you'll become that big prelate. Bring me my breviary. Right? So that books can become a sign of power, of that game, that pride that we play. Right? On the other hand, Francis felt that his mission was to preach. He felt that his mission was to preach. And from the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215, the church had required that those who were going to preach have an education so they know what they're talking about. Sounds reasonable. So how do you <laughs> fulfill your vocation as a Franciscan and preach and also live simply and not have any books, right? 
So Francis finally approved the study. He wrote to Anthony of Padua, another great saint, who apparently found his books. Um, and uh, he, uh, he wrote to Anthony, he said, uh, it pleases me that you, that you uh, teach the brothers theology, and this is important, as long as it does not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion. As long as it does not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion. That's the condition. The question is, can you pull that off? A lot of Franciscans contemporary with Bonaventure thought you couldn't. So you have Jacopone de Todi, the great uh, Franciscan poet, saying, cursed be Paris that has killed my Assisi. All these Franciscans run off to Paris and become smarty pants intellectual academics. Right? They run off to Harvard and then they come back. And, you know, that's the idea. It's killed the spirit of Assisi. Bonaventure saw things differently. Hmm? What happened to my phone? Oh, it's gone. Um, Bonaventure saw things differently. In a letter he wrote to someone interested in becoming a Franciscan, he said, I confess before God that this is what made me love the way of life of St. Francis. That it's like both the beginning and the perfection of the church, which first started from fishermen and afterwards advanced to the most renowned and skillful doctors. So for Bonaventure, the Franciscans represent this potential union of study and simplicity. So just like, you know, Peter was an uneducated fisherman and then Augustine follows a couple hundred years later, Bonaventure saw the Franciscan community as a kind of microcosm of that history. That they started with the simplicity of Francis and yet they've got Alexander of Hales and John of Iuda, I mean these really smart guys, Odo of Rigaud, all these superstars in Paris. So he says, that's a good thing. What Bonaventure hoped to do was bring that spirit of prayer and devotion into study because he believed it would make our theology better. That is, a theologian committed to a passionate life of holiness is going to see things differently. They'll see things better than the professional theologian or what we might call the theological technician. And then, armed with this wisdom, one of study and holiness, he's better prepared to preach and to teach. And I'll just tell you, I think that's a lesson we need still to learn today. Professionalization is in and of itself a bad thing because it brings rigor and it brings standards. You know, all these things are good. It makes us better in certain ways. But within that professionalization, it's so easy to lose sight of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And you could make that not just about theology. That could be about any particular profession where what you thought was a measure right, how am I doing, let me check in, becomes itself an end. You become all about those measures and not about the animating purpose that took you there, right? Bonaventure sees that as a big risk in study, and yet he still thinks study is worth it, right? Why? Because wisdom is worth it. Wisdom is worth it. Do you need to go to school for wisdom? No. If you're Francis, <laughs> you can get to wisdom without a degree, right? But most of us need to take smaller steps. Most of us need to understand the bits. And Bonaventure is convinced that knowledge leads to understanding, but that for, to go from knowledge and understanding to, hope, to wisdom, you need holiness. So you need all those bits. You need knowledge, you need understanding, you need holiness of life, then you can be wise. Wisdom is worth the risk. All right, so that's the sort of animating reason for Bonaventure's theological vision. But what is that vision? I want to take some time to kind of unpack that a little bit for you today. I want to say, first of all, that Bonaventure is a traditional Orthodox Catholic theologian. He's a doctor of the church. He's deeply Augustinian, so a lot of what you find in, in Bonaventure, you'll find in Augustine already. Um, he's influenced by a bunch of other people that I'll throw, I could throw the names out, but it wouldn't be worth it. We can talk about that later if you're interested. But so what you're not going to find are anything, any radically new conclusions on this or that doctrine. But 
his very, his genius really, his power is to integrate all these figures and all these themes from the tradition, to put them all together with this Franciscan drive to the spirit of prayer and devotion, and to, to put it all together in that way. Um, that's, so it's distinctive as a whole, more than distinctive in its parts. So what are we talking about? Well, first, if we're talking about God, God, for Bonaventure, is what he calls the self-diffusive, or he uses this word, the self-diffusive quality of the good. What does that mean? Well, it's a traditional principle of, of Neoplatonism, you know, Neoplatonic philosophy. But what's he thinking? His beginning point of, if you're going to think about God, you need to think about the good, because God is the fullness of goodness, right? You need to think about the good, and what is the good? Well, do you ever hear this sort of trite expression, love isn't love until you give it away? Anybody ever heard that? Love isn't love until you give it away. What does it mean? Well, anything that, any love that you would have and sort of cling to and possess and say, mine, mine, mine. Well, by that very reason, it wouldn't be love, would it? Or it would be less than perfect love anyway. Right? Same with goodness. Goodness, in order to be good, gives itself away. That's part of what it means to be good. Right? The good diffuses itself. Bonaventure says that's true of God in God's self. The good diffuses itself. That means that, the, that God needs to be Trinity. <laughs> How does he get there? Well, you get there by saying, well, if the good needs to diffuse itself, it needs to perfectly communicate itself within itself. How would it do that? Well, maybe you have a lover and a beloved and then if you had perfect love, because this kind of love between two can be kind of a mutual egotism, right? Perfect love would be that would be a sharer in love, and a third. A third person of, uh, who would be a, a sharer in that perfect love. So that this love that I have that's so complete with the one, I am not jealously clinging to but willing to share. So what I want you to imagine for Bonaventure's vision of what Trinitarian life is like, is like, it's like a three-person waltz, right? Where the lover gives to the beloved, and the beloved shares in love, and the lover gets, right? And you have this sort of dynamism, this kind of moving around. The energy of love is what God is. So within God, you have this self-diffusive, self-emptying love between persons. He says, if we're going to conceive of God in the most elevated and loving manner, we have to understand that God can communicate himself completely by eternally having a beloved and another who is loved by both. And they must have the highest mutual intimacy by which one person is necessarily in the other because of their radical identity. So the father gives himself so completely to the son that he's fully in the son even as he's father. All right, it's God. You know, you don't expect it to be a math, <laughs> a math problem, right? But so you have this, this sort of dynamism of self-gift. And what Bonaventure says is that's the deepest truth, if we were going to translate it, right, for terms that we understand. Because we get hung up with terms like God and stuff. We tend to think God is that guy over there or those three guys over there, God and the Godettes, right? Um, what, what Bonaventure means by the term God is the deepest truth about the world the thing that's most true and most real, right? That is the, is the dynamic power of love. It's as real as quarks, and it's as real as quantum theory. I shouldn't say that, right? But that's, that's the principle, right? It's that kind of force in the universe. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that creation is best understood as a kind of overflowing of that love. The spontaneous, generous decision of God right, to give God's self away even beyond the perfect self-gift that's the Trinity, to pour, overflow from that fullness that's God and overflow into creation. So he, he's full of images of creation as a river or as a waterfall, rushing out, right? As, an, as a river that flows into an ocean. What does this mean for creation? 
It means that creation is an expression of that same outpouring love and life that is God somewhere outside of God. One of Bonaventure's favorite scriptures is, is uh, the letter, to James, letter of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift descends from on high from the Father of lights. Right? So you get that kind of flowing image of every good gift, including existence itself, issuing forth from that dynamism of love, from the Father's gift to the Son, sort of overflows into creation. Right? That's what creation is. What that means is that creation itself is dynamic, and that it has a trajectory. It's made by love, by perfect love that is God. It's made out of love by this sort of gift. And it's made for love. Its whole purpose is to come back and return. Right? Now, I said, this is not something Bonaventure invents. If you read Tom Aquinas' uh, inaugural lecture, he talks about the rivers that descend from on high and then return to above. It's a theme that they share. Right? But there's this preponderance that James 1.17 is just everywhere in Bonaventure. This, that the, the image that he wants us to have of what creation and grace and redemption are, are this sort of teeming, abundant gift of God. So that's creation. What else does it mean? Well, it means, if that's true, it means that everything in creation, everything that, we, everything that exists, and we, we don't just mean like trees and flowers, that too, yeah, but thoughts, <laughs> shoelaces, rocks, all anything that exists, anything that, that is, is potentially a theophany, a, son, a manifestation of God, of God's own life. Bonaventure says, we are so created that the material universe itself is a ladder by which we may ascend to God. And he says, whoever is not enlightened by such great splendor in created things is blind. Whoever remains unheedful of such great outcries is deaf. Whoever does not praise God in all these effects is dumb. And whoever does not turn to the first principle, that is God, after so many signs is a fool. And he says, so open your eyes. Alert the ears of your spirit. Unlock your lips and apply your heart so that you may see, hear, praise, love, adore, magnify, and honor your God in every creature. So, what comes next? Why don't we do this? You know, in the face of that, why do we sort of turn, why don't we, why isn't that clear to us? Sin. Bonaventure says, well, however it happened, Adam, right? The sin in Adam, original sin. He says, by turning away from the true light to a changeable good, Adam and all his descendants were bent over. The Latin term is de corvatus. I mean, you have the sense that we're sort of warped and distorted in our very being. Right? We're, we're hunchbacks. <laughs> right? What's the effect of it? Well, again, this is very traditional. Ignorance, weakness, disordered desire. Those are the sort of symptoms of that distortion, the way they manifest. Right? So he says the result is that man, blinded and bent over, sits in darkness and does not see the light of heaven. So you have this vision of this guy sort of hunched over, like, kind of like that. And when you, when you think about that as an image of what original sin is, what this de corvatus in se, this, this bent over into yourself that is sin, it means that you can't rightly relate to your neighbor, right? You can't look him in the eye. You can't rightly relate to the natural world because if you try to pick things up, you can't use your body the right way, right? You can't rightly relate, so let's just for our sake, you know, can't rightly relate to God because you can't even look up, right? You can't see the light of heaven. You can't even rightly relate to yourself, right? Your body is a source of affliction to you, and not just your body, your whole, your soul in this way, right? If you are de corvatus in se, if you're curved into yourself in this way. That's what original sin is. That's why we can't see it. So what's the remedy? Well, the remedy is incarnation. Bonaventure's particular take, you know, this is the nativity, right? Bonaventure's particular take on, on incarnation is the incarnation, this is a Franciscan sort of way of thinking of it. Incarnation is a manifestation of the humility of God. He may be familiar, or he may not be. There's a passage in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, right? For 
though he was in the form of God, God is up in his godness, right? Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself. If I were more daring and it were not so dark, I'd jump off just for dramatic effect. But I'm not going to do that. I'm afraid I'd break my ankle. Um, for though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to grasp, but rather he emptied himself. He poured himself out, is literally what the Greek says, right? He poured himself out, taking on the form of a slave, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross, right? That's the humility of God. God didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped, but gave himself completely to identify with human beings in their weakness, in their poverty, in their fragility, He's born in a lost corner of the world, <laughs> right? At least in terms of worldly terms. Lost corner of the Roman Empire. He's born in a stable, attended first by shepherds, the lowest of the low. Right? The humility of God. And where does that all lead, of course? The humility of God is manifest in this naked dead guy on a cross. Right? So this, the claim here is that when human beings are our most weak, our most humiliated, our most poor, our most ungodlike, at least as we would traditionally think of God, right? Represented by this naked dead guy. In that place, when we're there, when humanity is there, God is there too. God has already been there. Which means that even poverty, isolation, death, Nakedness, even that is not a God-free zone. God is present to that. So that's what the, the crucified represents. This paradox that, that, that this human being, naked and dead, <laughs> is God himself. So uh, Bonaventure says we should embrace the crucified. We should embrace the crucified in this way even to the end. So what follows after the crucified? Well, resurrection. And what follows for us is the life of grace. Bonaventure's image in every, every piece of writing where he talks about what theology is for or what we need to do, he says, well, theology is for to give us enough knowledge of what we need to know in order to be saved in this our life as wayfarers, via Torres, right? People on the road, pilgrims, Time is. Right? That's the goal. Right? We are, in this life, in this world, we are mendicants. <laughs> we are wandering the, 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 path, the byways of this our world. Right? Entirely dependent. What? On God's gracious gift. We don't own anything. Right? So life within the church, so to speak, life within the body of Christ after the witness of Christ in this way, is a call to recognize our own sort of mendicancy, our own need, our own dependence, a contingency on God. He likes to use in a couple of places the image of Israel in Exodus, right? They leave, they go out into the desert, they follow the pillar of fire ahead of them. Right? And the pillar of fire is divine teaching. Right? So we are this community in the desert on the way to the promised land following the fire of divine teaching so that we can get there. We can get there in the end. Um, what does that mean, though? Does that mean it's all about what's still to come? Well, Bonaventure is a significant figure in, a, in what we might call a theology of hope. In fact, you may know, Benedict XVI, uh, current Pope Joseph Ratzinger, wrote his second dissertation, as you do in Germany, on St. Bonaventure. And he wrote it on history and hope, more or less. Um, he just visited, uh, Benedict just visited uh, Bagno Reggio um, earlier this year. And he highlighted this notion that, that Bonaventure teaches us to hope. And he alluded to his own writings on Space Salvi, right? The, the, the uh, hope of salvation. And says how deeply formed he was by... Bonaventure. And yet, Bonaventure is also considered, you know, one, some pope called him sometime, the prince of mystics. Right? That he has, the, he has a deep sense of the mystical theology, meaning that if we're waiting in joyful hope for the coming of the Lord, 
That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the waiting that we do doesn't begin to participate in that life that we'll have in fullness later. Right? So our union with God can begin now, here and now, in this moment of history, in this moment of time, even as it's an anticipation of what's to come. I'll, I'll, cross, uh, party, I'll cross the aisle here for a moment and refer to a Dominican. Um, <laughs> right? Catherine of Siena uh, supposedly said, and Dorothy Day quotes it a lot, but I haven't ever been able to find it in Catherine, but let's just say, Catherine of Siena reportedly said something like this, all the way to heaven is heaven because Jesus is the way. All the way to heaven is heaven because Jesus is the way. So the teaching there, the Bonaventure sort of grasps, he doesn't say exactly that, but he might as well. What he says is, the union with God that we have now is an anticipation of what we will have in future times. Right? The blessings that will come later begin now. Bonaventure, that's, so that's the sort of picture of Bonaventure's vision. Bonaventure taught this vision his whole life, even after he became uh, Minister General of the Franciscans. I realized I have a whole timeline of his life here that I, I'll, I meant to hand out to you so you'd have it in front of you. You probably couldn't read it anyway, but I'll have it here if you want to check it out later. Um, he teaches theology for uh, a little bit of time, and then he becomes Minister General of the Franciscans. He's in charge of the whole crew. Um, even after he becomes Minister General and is an administrator his whole life, he never stops teaching. In fact, in 1273, right before he dies, he's giving this last series of lectures, and that's the book that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm working on now, about it, which is on this last book. But he's called away before he finishes those lectures to become Cardinal Archbishop of Albano, and he was summoned by the Pope to prepare for a council, a church council, the Council of Lyon, um, which was going to be devoted to the reunification of the Eastern Orthodox and the Western churches. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was called to that council too, and he died on the way before he got there. So Thomas and Bonaventure die in the same year. Bonaventure makes it though, and he's really in charge. He shepherds the council through three sessions. They get a verbal agreement between the Eastern and the Western churches. It could have all been over. <laughs> and then he was about to start the fourth session, um, and he died in his sleep. And the whole thing fell apart. So he died in his sleep um, on July 15th, 1274. His funeral was attended by the Pope, the Papal Curia, the Fathers of the Council, both East and West, and Brother Peter of Tarantasia, who was the Dominican uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Ostia, and he later became Pope Innocent V. And he said the Mass for the funeral, and he preached on the text, I grieve for you, my brother Jonathan, where uh, David uh, loses Jonathan in the Old Testament. Bonaventure was interred in the cathedral uh, in Lyon um, until the Protestant Reformation and all the troubles in France that happened then where they, uh, <laughs> they dug out his body and burned it in the city square. Except for his head, which was rescued by this heroic priest in the church, grabbed his head and put it back in the church. But then, the, uh, then in the French Revolution, they lost the head too. So there's, there's no sign of... No sign of Bonaventure's body left. Wagner Regio says they have his arm, and who am I to say? But it's one of these Catholic things, you know. You got his arm? Sure, you got his arm. Why not? But as a Catholic, I believe in the communion of saints. And Bonaventure stands for me, as I said in the beginning, personally, as a model and as a companion. And as I ask the kinds of questions uh, that he asked, and I think are as important now as they were then. Questions like, how can I see God in the world around me? How can I keep the spirit of prayer and devotion enkindled in all the busyness of life? How do I wait in joyful hope? So just in closing, I, I, I just repeat that I think Bonaventure still has quite a lot to teach me and perhaps even teach us. Thank you all for your attention. Go ahead.
Uh, do you have any information that you can share about um, uh, what surrounded or prompted uh, or any life circumstances regarding St. Bonaventure's writings of the little soldiers to the Blessed Virgin Mary? Um, let's see. The, when, as Minister General, uh, Bonaventure was called upon by communities throughout uh, both poor Clare communities, um, you know, women's communities, and, uh, and men's communities, to support them in their, in their spiritual life. Um, and so it came, as I, it, as I remember, that came as a particular request from a, a community um, to compose something that would, that would assist them in their prayer. Uh, and they, I think... I think that community was devoted to Mary in a particular way, and so he wrote those uh, those little hours there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. Uh, one thing that always struck me about Bonaventure that he seemed to highlight pretty well uh, that he did to work about what he seems to be talking about to me is a type of spiritual epistemology mm -hmm. that sort of presents itself over and against the quietest of ways, actually, but that presents itself as kind of a a mystical epistemology almost, hmm. where, where understanding of God and understanding of the world sort of become one. I think of sort of the itinerary here and uh, a couple other places, but you say a few words about that. Um, I would say that, uh, I mean, I think that's right. I, I, for one, am not terribly tempted, well, no, I should say, I, I consider it important part of what I do when I look at Bonaventure, not to contrast him so much. There are clear differences between Bonaventure and Thomas. Uh, but I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of identity politics have sort of gotten me, you know, Bonaventure's our guy because we're Franciscans, and you know, Thomas is our guy, and, and a, lot of, a lot of common wisdom is lost. So, I mean, that's the only caution I would say. Now, having said that, um, is there a kind of mystical epistemology well, I would, yeah, I, mean, I suppose, I guess I would prefer to call it a, a sort of sacramental vision, right? I mean, I think that Bonaventure has a deeply sacramental vision that grows out of Francis, really, out of that Franciscan tradition. I don't actually think it's entirely, you know, it's entirely other than Thomas in, in that way. I mean, I think that Thomas is deeply infused with that same sensibility. Um, so some of those differences that you're, you're pointing to, I think, emerge out of genre differences in the kind of writing they're doing, not, ne not necessarily in substantive differences in terms of their, their approach or their thought. But suffice to say, what Bonaventure sees, Bonaventure's worry about this theo theological uh, technology, you know, this sort of technician approach, uh, or education in general this way. What he worries about is that when you get, when, when you get into education stuff, right, you can, you, there's so much great stuff to know that you just want to know everything, and you fall in love with all these little bits. But, but because you fall in love with all these little bits, you fall in love with the surfaces. And Bonaventure is deeply convinced that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a dearest freshness deep down things, right? Right? That there's a, there's a truth and a beauty that if you follow anything down to its root, you find God. And if you fail to do that, that's what he calls, and this is in the middle, medieval terms, curiosity, the sin of curiosity. Right? Not the hunger to know good stuff. That, that wouldn't be curiosity. Right? Curiosity is a sin, is a sort of desire to know this surface and to know this surface, right? And sort of gather all this kind of surface knowledge without going to the root. Everything that you encounter can be, in Bonaventure's terms, he would say reduced. You can be led back through the thing to its root in God. And that's what real knowledge is. Anything short of that um, becomes a, a tool of pride, basically. That's one of his deep worries. It's his worry about Aristotle or Aristotelian education in the 13th century. And where Thomas and Bonaventure really do have a difference of opinion is how dangerous that is. So, you know, that, that's, that's where I would say that there's a real difference there. Is that getting in the direction of an answer to your question? Great. What else? What other thoughts? Hey. Um, did Bonaventure have anything to say about the Crusades as they were present during this time? Um, no, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, you may know or you may not know that, that Francis um, desperately, he tried so hard 
to go on crusade. And he finally made it once. And there's a whole legend about Francis going and preaching to the, uh, to the sultan. And some people say he converted, but couldn't admit it to his, well, it's not true, but, um, <laughs> right. So, I mean, this is the story. The Franciscans as a whole are deeply committed to preaching to the Saracens, right? They're not afraid to, um, in other words, the, when they go along on crusade, they're, they're quite willing to get on the boat with crusaders then. They want to go preach. Sometimes there's a story about Francis of preaching a particular, you know, a particular battle that you shouldn't go in this battle, right? And they go on the battle and they get beaten and slaughtered. Um, uh, there's a, a new book out on Francis, particularly on the Crusades. I actually think that overstates the case a little bit. I, I mean, I love, I think Francis is a peaceful soul, um, but I don't think that you have a sort of strong opposition to Crusade in that way. I mean, to understand that, you have to understand the ways in which Crusade was a, in the medieval mindset, was a battle to reclaim what was taken from us, right? Because Jerusalem is Jesus' city, right? And it was ours, and they came and took it, right? So, so if you think about it in that way, from the medieval mindset, a crusade is a defensive war, right? And in that way, you're not going to get a whole lot of, you're going to have mixed feelings, anyway, among Franciscans like the rest of Christendom. About, uh, about that sort of phenomenon. What else? Could you speak to uh, the possibilities as, uh, as the general? As a minister general, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, like all administrators, there were <laughs> lots of tasks that were not so fun. Um, he traveled to visit all, every community he could. And like I said, he did so on foot. Um, his responsibility was as teacher and administrator. So he wrote uh, letters to his communities, to sort of uh, general letters to the whole community saying, you know, here's what I see going on, here's what needs shaping up, right? And this was part of the reason why he would uh, walk around and visit these places, was because he was trying to get as much data as he could as to how people were doing. The Franciscans were a deeply uh, divided community precisely because of that sort of, that fervor and devotion on the one hand, and yet the sense that this is an institution, this community, is an institution that is contributing to rebuilding the church, right? That sort of introduces a real tension. And one of his tasks, really, is to try to pour uh, oil on that turbulent water. His predecessor um, got into a little bit of trouble. He was a good friend of his. Uh, got into a little bit of trouble because he picked sides in a particular conflict that you know, was kind of embarrassing to the Franciscan community as a whole. So Bonaventure, one of Bonaventure's chief jobs was to sort of tighten up the ship a little bit, keep, keep things as calm as he could, and to and give some structure to this way of life. I don't know if you've ever studied sort of basic sociology, sociological models like in Weber, that where communities move from the charisma of a founding to kind of institutionalization and rationalization, right? If you've ever studied that, you can see that at work in the Franciscans, right? Francis really didn't want to have anything to do with uh, administration, <laughs> right? So he actually resigned as head of his community before he died. He didn't want to do it anymore, right? Um, and, and in his last writing shows a little bit of regret that what, you know, a little bit of longing for those days of simplicity when it was just him and his pals, right? And yet, the sense that this community has something to give to the church means you need some structure. So one of the things that Bonaventure does is, is uh, um, compose the, the, what are called the, the constitutions of Narbonne, right? These sort of basic constitutions of how this community is supposed to run. Kind of a constitution, yeah, I mean a constitution, like a, a, a bylaws, right? Um, and uh, so he composes that. Um, one last thing that wasn't his responsibility uniquely as minister general, but ended up being a significant part of his responsibility. The whole way of life of mendicancy, of not having any possessions, either private or communal, like the whole Franciscan community couldn't own anything, right? It had to sort of borrow, basically. Um, that, that whole way of life comes under attack several times during his tenure. So he has to defend the whole idea of the, the existence of his community, its basic founding idea. So he spends a lot of time doing that as well throughout his career. Is that 
get you in the direction of that? Good. What else? They're really the um, the 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 Council of Lyon was really dedicated to trying to work out some of the theological questions, like on the Trinity. I don't know how much you're familiar with this, but you know this sort of age-old argument about whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or whether it proceeds from the Father through the Son, right? And um, historically, it looks like it really was a kind of uh, an emendation that the West introduced to to say the Father and the Son. Right? The filioque controversy, it's called. So they were trying to work out that question, among others. There were some issues of governance and papal primacy and all these sorts of things. Um, so, but it was, prim at least what we know is that a lot of it was about the theology, the, some of the big theological issues. Um, the problem is, and this happens a lot in these kinds of discussions, the team that comes to meet to talk about things, they all get together and they agree, and then they take it back to their home communities and they go, what? You can't do that! And that's essentially what happened. So nothing really came of it. Whether Bonaventure could have done anything more if he had lived through the fourth session or not, well, I like to think he could, but, you know, I'm a fan. So, <laughs> um, so who knows? But, that, but that's, you know, does that answer your question? Uh-huh, good. Yeah. Did certain qualities of Bonaventure cause tension within the Franciscan community, namely his uh, education and being named the Cardinal, which is kind of, in a sense, contradictory to the initial Franciscan um, Being named a Cardinal doesn't seem to have generated a, a, a particular problem because he, didn't, he already turned it down once. Uh, he was actually nominated to, as Archbishop of York in England and refused that. Um, because he wanted to serve his community uh, some more. And he felt that they were in a dangerous spot. And so he refused that. And there's this great story, i got to tell. Um, <laughs> who knows if it's true or not. But the story goes that uh, Bonaventure was named Cardinal, and he was out on his tours. And when he went out on his tours, he joined in the life of the community. And so as the, the papal delegates arrived to give him his big red hat, you know, that cardinals get, um, he was doing the dishes. <laughs> you know, because that's what you did when you joined them with your community. And uh, so they came in, they said, well, the, the, the Pope's people are here. And he said, well, just tell them to leave it on a bush. Right? So some of, the, some of the sort of iconography you see of Bonaventure has, you know, a, a cardinal's red hat on a, on a bush for that reason. Um, so, I mean, that says something about how that was understood. Now, the more interesting question is, um, because of the, the tensions about this institutionalization question, right? Because Bonaventure was willing to institutionalize in a certain way um, without trying, I mean, trying not to give away the store, right? Trying not to give away that original impulse. Because of that, he's a kind of a controversial character in the immediate years after his death. So what, one of the interesting facts that people have puzzled over a little bit is that Bonaventure, there's no movement to make him a saint, to canonize him um, for 200 years after his death. Thomas Aquinas, it's like, right there. They're like, this is our guy. We're going to, you know, and they start gathering information and everything. It, nobody's willing to take up the cause for, for Bonaventure early on. And it's because, I think, of this administrative role. He was in a position, <laughs> like administrators often are, of making nobody happy, right? Because he was trying to hold on to some of the inspiration, that spirit of prayer and devotion on the one hand, and also trying to say, well, we want to be around for a little while, too. So how do we hold these things together? Well, that's not going to keep the, the, you know, the, the called spiritual Franciscans happy on this side. It's not going to keep the people who are you know, ready to give away the store <laughs> happy on the other side. So you know, I think that he sort of falls between the cracks in a certain way for a good long time um, until a non-Franciscan really takes up the call. Jean Gerson um, who starts reading Bonaventure and says, whew! And so he starts the ball rolling, and then a couple hundred years later it comes in, or a hundred years later it comes in. What else? Enough? Thank you all. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much.